So welcome back to another episode of LifeSci AI, the, the podcast series. Uh, today, we are joined by the CEO of Blackford Analysis, uh, Ben Panter. Uh, Blackford Analysis are, are based in Edinburgh and are a software platform um, utilizing and, and trying to simplify uh, the use of uh, products within the healthcare domain. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot more to the story of, of Ben and, and, and Blackford Analysis. Uh, so I'll leave it over to, to Ben now to uh, properly introduce himself, a little bit about his background and, um, and Blackford, but, but welcome to the podcast, Ben. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. So um, I, I think you, your question really was, you know, how, how did I get to the point where, where we started Blackford? Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I spent eight years as an astronomer uh, through a PhD, various fellowships, building a, an algorithm uh, along with my supervisor who that, that, that kind of that accelerated the process of trying to understand the galaxy from its spectra. So taking the light, splitting it into its different um, constituents, different colors, wavelengths, and trying to model that very quickly. And the process that we developed took processing of a galaxy down from eight hours or so down to about a minute. And that combined with a, a huge survey of um, millions of galaxies called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey allowed us to build the star formation record of the whole universe and get some interesting insights about when big galaxies and small galaxies formed their stars. And that was great. You know, it was uh, a paper that was published in Nature and spawned all sorts mm. of pieces. But I kind of knew that I wanted to take this technology and do something a bit more relevant with it. Uh, you can kind of, uh, you can spend your life um, studying galaxies, but they tend not to give you much back. <laughs> um, and, and the question really was, okay, well, we've got this cool technology, where, where could we use it? Mm. And uh, that, that really kicked off a, an interest in the commercial side as well as the technology side. Because right. quite often you solve a problem with a great piece of technology, but you're not really solving a problem that has value to someone. So, you know, we, we looked at taking this technology and putting it into seismology, where you go off and you, you survey um, the, the subsea oil reserves in the North Sea, and then you come back and you have to process this data, and we could really accelerate the processing of that data. And you think that sounds fantastic, but actually the data sits in a warehouse for two years before it's ever processed. So it's not right. kind of time critical. And no one's gonna pay you to accelerate a process that, that doesn't need accelerating. We looked at mobile phones and back then GSM was the standard and it turns out that GSM is still pretty much the standard for mobile phone data. So we weren't gonna make, make much progress there. Um, and then we looked at banking and uh, this was 2007 when it was still a good idea to have rocket science yeah. and banking kind of, you know, <laughs> added together. 2008 yeah. came along and that really wasn't a great plan. Yeah. But, but we'd, we'd had some interest from a group of medical physicists at the Western General here in, in Edinburgh. And they had a, a cohort of patients that they called the Lothian cohort, which is basically a group of people who'd had an MR scan every year for about 20 years. And this was an incredibly rich data set that showed um, neurodegeneration. So what's happening to people's brains as they age, what's a normal rate of degeneration and what's a, um, a rate associated with a particular condition, you know, Alzheimer's or whatever else. And the first thing they had to do was line up the, the data set that they got this year with the data set that they got last year. And that was taking them 20 minutes or so for each data set. So it was a big laborious process. And they said, well, it would be great if you could just speed that up. I said, well, that sounds interesting. Let's see what we can do. We got some money from Scottish Enterprise, still as an academic, built an algorithm that could do this process in about a second. And the, wow. the medical physicists were delighted. <laughs> and they said, we should show this to the radiologists. And the radiologists said, well, this is really great, but uh, do you think you could do it in our normal workflow? Could you make our clinical processes like this just as quick? Because fundamentally, if you're a radiologist, you're looking for what has changed in an image. 
it got better, yeah. worse, or stayed the same. Um, and that really was what 11 years ago persuaded us to start the company and um, initiate Blackford. And the rest, you know, from there, happy to talk about. But that, that was kind yeah. of the backstory to Blackford and how how we came to set the company up. Wow, that, that's fascinating. Um, I, I didn't realize you were approached by uh, a group of clinicians in, in, in Scotland and sort of, how did they get in touch with you? Did they see your paper uh, in, in, they, in the- in No, the, I mean, we, we, were busy, we were busy trying to understand where this technology could be useful. Right. Um, right. And we had a, a long list of organizations or areas that involved lots of data and needed to have results quickly. And it was a hunch really that we could go and talk to these people and they turned out to be friendly and, and on we went. <laughs> yeah. And I think the the real the key piece that, that we got from that though is that you, you don't necessarily understand what problems people really experience until you sit by their side. So in the in the case of the radiologists, yeah. it was sitting in the reading room with them and seeing the, the you know they'd bring up the prior image they'd bring up the current study they'd bring up another prior they'd hunt and peck around to try and find the linkage and it was only really once we'd got into that deep understanding of how they actually did their job that yeah. we were able to see that maybe this technology would be useful in a certain way I see. Um, and, I, and i think it's a it, i hope it's not just us i think it's a common problem when you're trying to transfer technology from one area to another that really having to get to grips with understanding the reality of the problem rather than mm. what you think is the problem. You know, I, I remember see. lots of uh, coffee time chats in academia about, oh, well, the world must be this way. And, and if only they did it this, this way, it would solve all, every problem. And of course, when you're actually tackling reality, when you're getting out of the lab, when you're actually trying to understand what the real problem is, you realize it's quite different. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's been very useful as we've developed the company over the years to really go back to that first principle of what is it that the customer needs you to do rather yeah. than what do you think they should be doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, and, yeah. And what do you think their problem is? Well, it might not be what you think it is. Yeah. Listening rather than imposing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a balance, right? It, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a conversation. In fact, it's many conversations. Mm. You know, trying to see different ways of solving a particular problem and just being open to um, compromise and, and understanding that you're not the authority on something. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's that's that learning has really helped us a huge amount as we've developed Blackford mm -hmm. because we have a kind of different focus now, right? So we're a yeah. platform business now and we're taking the learnings that we have of how, how difficult it was both um, technically to deploy that algorithm into a workflow yeah and commercially to get all the way through all the processes in a hospital <laughs> yeah. to be able to get it deployed and in use and we yeah. recognized back in 2016 that this was something that was a, a really hard won experience and the mm. deployed base that we had and were building at that time had potential to be able to be a, a route for many other products to get to market. Yeah, and that's really yeah. when we did our kind of shift to being a a platform for third party applications, and to try and do everything we can to make efficient adoption of all these different AI technologies, clinical applications as we call them, yeah. into a radiology workflow, and to try and really homogenize and unify that that process. Mm. I see. Okay. So the algorithm then itself, how far did that did that go? Was that being used in clinical settings? Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, uh, I think currently we process, we're in about 800 sites now across the US, Australia and New Zealand wow. uh, with the platform and the vast majority of the platform deployments that we have run that um, registration yeah, algorithm it's called the Smart Localizer. Um, or auto registration in, in some markets. But mm. yeah, that, that's been a, a great success for Blackford. And mm. really it's that deployed base that we leverage to accelerate the sales of all the third party algorithms that we carry. I see, I see. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it was, 
I, I think the, the big shift for Blackford was originally we thought that we were building a platform that we would populate with our own products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the shift really is that we we now have a platform that we populate with our own mm. and other people's products. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like yes, yeah, so, so you saw the success, but then you also saw the the problem that that you have had in implementing this into the into yeah. the the radar's workflow, and thought, okay, we can solve this problem as well. Um, I, I think the, the the technical problem is is important absolutely mm. um and back then we we kind of we were just solving the problem of how do you get data out of a packs quickly yeah so you know packs are the, the, there's a variety of capabilities some don't have you know they're designed with a very specific purpose in mind which is to store data display most of it once to a radiologist and then make sure that they've got that safely stored away in case it's ever needed in the future. Yeah. Um, they're not designed to be able to fetch all sorts of data very quickly from different time points in a patient's history. So you'll have some prior images which are in kind of um, slower access storage that are maybe topologically further away. You have to solve those problems. And, and at that point, we kind of, we considered the world as how do you get data out of the packs? Mm. We also then had to work out how do you get the results useful for the radiologist. So you can't spin up a separate um, viewer because that's not how radiologists read studies. They've got no interest in reading the study here and then trying to work out something over here and then looking at this screen and you know it's got to be there yeah. in their in their existing workflow. So we had one of the first deep integrations into viewers for this kind of um, clinical application um, algorithmic product AI, maybe you could call it that. Yeah. That, that, you, that you actually, from the existing user interface, you would click and, and something would happen, you know, it would line up the prior studies. Oh, I but see. Trying I see. to do a huge amount of processing ahead of time, getting all the data in the right place, working out what the correct algorithm to apply is because you want a different algorithm for the yeah. head or chest or whatever else, fixing all of that ahead of time, such that when the radiologist opens their study, as if by magic, it's easier to read. I see. And, and I think that, you know, there's a real, there's a temptation to go, look at our technology, it's great. You're gonna to want to spend your entire life just looking at this wonderful thing. <laughs> and then the, the response from the radiologist is, do you have any idea how many studies I have to read today? I don't have time to look at your bright, shiny widget. I just want to get on with my job. Yeah. And I think as, as long as you keep that in mind and you really focus on what is it that drives productivity for the radiologist, mm. that's a great way to think about the world. And if you're going to I do see. that, you need to be integrated into the work list. You need to be integrated yeah. into the UA. You need to be integrated into reporting. You need to be looking at downstream comms to the referring physician. And really, all of that. I mean, so, so this is all in the kind of technology space. Yeah. And, and trying to think about how to homogenize all of those different components. And that's really what Blackford does, right? Mm -hmm. so, so from the technology perspective, we have all those hooks into all the different systems. And we make that a much more um, smooth experience for the radiologist, but also a smooth experience for the clinical application that wants to integrate into workflow. Right. I see. Uh, so so that, that's the technology side. Yeah. But there's an even bigger problem that you have to solve as well. And that is how on earth do you navigate um, the hospital processes to allow you to deploy such a product in their site? You know, there's um, the initial marketing. How do you get in front of the right people in the hospital? Yeah. <laughs> how do you work through their procurement cycle? How do you get the contract in place? You know, there's all sorts of different terms, liabilities, business associate agreements to cover whether you can have the PHI or not. How do you deploy the hardware? You know, is it cloud? Is it on-premise? What are the information security um, constraints around doing that? What are the regulatory constraints on the product? You know, how do you make sure that your indications for use are being appropriately communicated to the user mm. training's taken place? And all of this means that, you know, any individual hospital especially in the US, could probably integrate one application a year, if you're lucky. 
Right. Now, if you've got a platform approach and you do the platform once, and remember, we've got to do all of those boxes to check off with the platform. Once you've done that, it's a very simple process to add more products in. I so see. suddenly you're changing the entire economics, both from a hospital perspective and from a clinic perspective, yeah. of how you deploy product. And that's really the, the platform business model, right? That yeah. you, you move from being um, a kind of a, a technology plug-in point, which is handy, yeah. to being a complete solution that solves the problem both for the radiologist, for the administration in the hospital, mm. for the clinic provider, um, for the PACS admin, you know, you, you, you've got to solve for all of those stakeholders. Um, and that's really the, the that, that's what we do at Blackfield. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And you, you said that that would change in 2016. Um, so that, that, that was when we across. decided that yeah, the, to go platform. a platform approach was the yeah. right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Initially, we were more focused on the technology side than the mm. computer side. Yeah. You know, as we learned more and as we deployed more of our own product, that really was a shift to it's not just a technology problem, it's a, a whole yeah. um, platform business approach. Mm. And did you, what was the what was the catalyst for that? Where was there a moment or was there a few moments that you thought, hang on a minute, there's something we can give something more than just a product here. We can give a platform and we can enable more people um, to have access to this. Was there a particular moment or was there a, a, a group of moments that, that, that changed your thinking for that? I think it was, um, you know, our first deployment of our original registration product. So that's the, the platform and the clinical application that does the, the, the groups. I mean, it took us years to get all the alignment between the PAX vendors to get their viewers in for in, in the right place to, to get yeah. the 510k done for the regulatory status and and we were ready and we were raring to go <clears throat> and we we were ready to deploy and we got a hospital lined up that really wanted to to use this product and yeah you know, the energy was all there everything was great yeah right let's get moving okay well you're gonna have to buy the servers blackford because we, we need you to fund that one fine we'll buy the servers right here's a servers that's yeah. been delivered <laughs> okay um well, right um I, I, are they ready for us to, to log into yet? Oh, yeah. uh, no, no, we, we, we've got to get IT to um, put them into the data center. All right, okay, okay. They're in the data center, brilliant. So a month later, um, are those servers, are they in the data center yet? Yeah, yeah, they are, but we need to put the operating system on. All oh, right, okay. A month later, the operating systems are great. Yeah, fantastic. Now, oh, when do yeah. we log in? Ah, we need you to fill out this information security assessment. Oh, okay, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, fill it out, fill it out get it back to them within a couple of days, brilliant, how can we have access? Yeah, well, that will be reviewed um, in the next meeting of the Information Security um, Committee, which is in a month's time. Oh, right, okay. Uh, okay, well, in a month's time, we'll come up. Oh, yeah, well, they wanted some clarity on this question here. Oh, and the process goes on and on and on. And in the end, our first deployment took 13 months to go from customer saying, yes, we want to do this, to yeah actually we're now live and the product is working wow. and that was a particular scenario where they were in the middle of changing their emr and it was backed up and you know it was something that we were doing as a kind of a if you trial the product we'll look. so but the amount of learning in that process that mm. you're not live until you're actually live and the time scales there and now we're down to i think the, the record is a couple of weeks Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's various ways that you can achieve that kind of speed. Mm -hmm. One of them is working through a channel partner um, where the legals are already in place. Yeah. But I, I think that just that recognition that it it's immensely complex if you've not been through that route before. Yeah. And there are many gotchas along the way that if you've done it a few times or you know, a few hundred times, you've got the the experience to be able to go uh, i think this is going to happen so we ought to go around that way instead yeah or, or we've chatted to them and they prefer on-premise to cloud or they're very open to cloud and their preferred provider is that vendor rather than that vendor and making sure that you have the inherent flexibility to be able to respond to those kind of requests is absolutely key right I see. and also you know when you when you're writing your security questionnaire 
having things like ISO standards, having the various different yeah. stock answers that you know to give make things a lot uh, smoother as a process. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, um, so, so but, but why, some people would, would think, okay, it's been 13 months and now we know, we know the complexity of this, we know the process. We can then use this for our benefit to increase capacity for our products. So then the next time that we put it into um, a hospital, it's quicker, it goes live quicker. Okay, cool. And the next one's quicker and then the next one's quicker. And we just place our product in better and in, in quicker. What, what particularly was it about yourselves that thought, okay, we can not only help our product and our algorithm, but we can help the third parties as well. Sure. Um, uh, without getting misty eyed, right? Uh, th this is about the time when when two little letters started appearing all over the place, A and I. <laughs> and and uh, I, I think we went from being one of five or six vendors at RSNA that had something that you did an algorithm that, 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 or a, an AI method, whatever you want to call it, that, yeah. that enabled you to deliver some useful result to a radiologist. Um, I mean, this was when advanced visualization was really going through its dramatic consolidation. When I first went to RSNA in 2007, I think it was, there were about 20 different advanced visualization vendors. Now, I think you'd see Vital, Terror Recon, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm struggling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, the, the, that, that was the big wave that was kind of hitting. CAD was a big thing, but that was kind of yeah. thing at the time as well. Um, and, and really, we then had a, a period where you know, you'd have the likes of Blackford, Fovia, various other entities that were supporting channels, building product. Um, but the, the big change was AI came and in the first year, there were maybe, you know, 10 vendors there. And we thought, well, this is interesting. Let's see where this goes. Then there were 40, then there were 80. Um, the year um, 2019, just before the pandemic, there were 129, right? Jeez. And all of these entities were going to face the same problems as we, we did. Yeah. The, the misty eyed bit is that I think that patients, clinicians, radiologists, healthcare economics in general can all massively benefit from AI. Mm. And the only way that that's going to happen is if you can actually get it adopted at scale in healthcare. Yeah. And that just isn't feasible if you're going algorithm by algorithm, company by company. And actually, I mean, I, I passionately believe that AI has tremendous potential to yeah. solve huge problems for healthcare. Yeah. But it won't happen unless we can find an efficient way to deploy at scale. Yeah. And for me, sure. that's what a platform business is all about, right? So, yeah. yes, I'm commercial as well. I would like to make money on that. Yeah. But I think that the, the absolute focus is that it's the only way that you can deploy yeah. the level of AI that you need to make an impact on the problems that healthcare has. Yeah. So, so like I said, you know, there's a danger that you get misty eyed there, but that's the, the real driver for me. How do you get this stuff adopted? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, especially you've seen the growth of it then firsthand um, because you and you work with these guys, you, you are their, their platform for, for a lot of them. Um, going so you are almost like an enabler, but also an innovator because you come from from that background. Um, you had a product uh, in the first instance, knowing, knowing, what, knowing the challenges yeah. that you face. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, how did you how did your business adapt, and what changes did you need to implement going from being just a product? When I say just a product, like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's it's no small it's a no small feat to get what you're doing. I'm not from, in any way offended. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, from from a product um, to a product plus platform. What did you need to do? How did you just change your um, setup, your hierarchies, your structure, and your focus? How did you enable that change? Sure. Um, I'd say that. Uh, 
gradually is probably the right answer. You know, we we started off working with a few partners just to explore what we needed to do to to um, work with their products. To you know, I think the the first year at RSNA we showed five or six products, some of which remain on the platform now, some of which the, the companies have either folded or gone their separate ways. Mm. Um, but you have to start looking for patterns. So what is what what are the features that you need as a platform that that meet the the kind of 80-20 rule? So so what is it that you can do with a small number of features that deliver most of the value that you would have from an app with its own interface or um, okay. you know, its own integration route or whatever else. And then you expand from that and you try and work out whether there are some edge cases there. So that's the kind of product stuff. Mm. Um, and I mean, you know, at the moment we're expanding our product team to really try and address that further. Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing that you need to do is um, get better at the capacity of how do you move all the marketing materials around? How do you keep everybody up to date? So we do a lot of our sales through channel partners. So we enable large companies who wish to have a platform and some of them are branded Blackford and some of them are branded, branded by that company itself um, to be able to take product to market and to have access to that huge complexity of products that we sit behind us. So you know, there's a level of just managing all the partnerships to bring the, the, the right materials at the right time to make sure that the software is up to date, to make sure that any contract amendments and pricing is, is propagated through. So it becomes a really big um, administrative task just to keep everything up to date and keep everything smooth because the fundamental piece is that you can't have special cases, right? Yeah. If you, if you said that you know, the limit of indemnity is this much, it's gotta be this much for all of the partners on that side because you can't say, well, except for that product, which is this <laughs> and for that one. Yeah. So there's a huge effort in homogenizing and trying to make sure that we're delivering something that's at the level the market needs. I see. Um, you know, on the regulatory side, just being really cautious that we've got all the bits and pieces lined up um, and what territories and what um, areas you can use the product, whether the pricing changes around different territories. You know, there's, it's just a really complicated um, picture because yeah. You've got to have all that complexity on the back end to be able to provide a very simple solution at the front. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess that's an element of it. I mean, the, the, from an engineering perspective, the focus moved away from um, image analysis, but we still do a fair amount of image analysis. You know, we still have that registration product that's still being updated and expanded yeah. to, okay, from a platform perspective, what do we need to do to integrate into worklist, into reporting, into the the viewer pieces? How do we, you know, how do we get the right element of a viewer that isn't necessarily standalone that fits within the PAX viewer? Yeah. Um, and and you know that 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 change in mindset is quite key. Um, I think the other thing is just understanding the economics of scaling a business like that. Yeah. You know, that that you're. You, you've got to you've got to be aware that you can't take you can't go out and take a hundred million of investment because actually you need to make sure that there's something in the pie for everybody. The yeah. ecosystem only works if the clinic provider, the channel, Blackford, the customer are all getting value out of the arrangement. Mm. And uh, you know it, it, it's just a constant balancing act, really. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that's interesting. So you still obviously still have that analysis work that you do but it was almost a, a, a shift into more of a, a business case the economics case and understanding the, the, the systems and the compliance yeah, and I, locations as well that's probably the, the, the differentiator between the two I, if you look at the companies now to 10 years ago or, or seven years ago that's probably is that the difference you would say yeah i, I think that if you <clears throat> i have a kind of simplistic picture in my mind of how <laughs> um information and knowledge exists within this um, AI ecosystem. Yeah. So at the bottom, we've got the underlying AI techniques. Yeah. And the absolute cutting edge AI techniques 
are available for free in libraries that you can download and get working with almost immediately. And the advent of really powerful GPUs and the fact that you can buy them um, by the cycle in the cloud means that the, the, there isn't really a tech barrier to entry anymore. It's yeah. all out there, it's available, it costs money, but you know it's not huge amounts. And then you look at data and you think, well, okay, there's, there's actually, it's harder to get to data. You can't get much of it for free. But mm. if you're working with a clinical partner, then there is plenty of reasonably well curated data. And it's a tractable problem to start labeling that. You can do that with, you know, th there are former radiologists that, that are happy to, to, to work along that line. It's, it's not a impossible problem. It costs money, but again, it's not impossible. Yeah. You then get up to the clinical problem um, where, you know, you need to talk to a clinician. You need to be able to think from a product management mindset about what is it that they really want. So it's so a bit harder, but still not impossible. But then you get to the really hard bits. And one of those, the first one would be workflow integration, right? So if you want to go out to all the different fax vendors and all the different workless vendors and all the different reporting vendors, and you want to get their attention such that you can build an integration with them, that takes years, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to sometimes go direct and sometimes find a way around. And sometimes you, you write some kind of patchy solution that will manage to get you in to where you need to be. But that workflow integration isn't something that you can just buy, right? It's, it's right. years of experience, years of solving those problems, understanding that two different hospitals or health systems with identical IT kit may need you to do things in a very different way. So building in huge amounts of flexibility that, okay, we have five ways to solve this problem. We'll try one through four and, and well, then we have to move to five, you know, yeah. or the particular focus of this organization is on this topic. Therefore, we have to be very cognizant of that and we have to prioritize that against this. Or it's a distributed pack, so we need to be aware that, you know, that archive doesn't necessarily have to talk to that archive so we can do separate channels. You know, just all, all these things that you learn over loads of deploy deployments. But the real, the real pinnacle of this pyramid, the piece where there really isn't much experience in the world mm. trying to understand a business case for adoption of AI in a health system. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you can, you, you look at, um, I guess, Viz, Rapid AI, um, maybe Heartflow. And those are the ones that have managed to get sustainable business growth. And really that's about stroke and stroke care. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. and heart flow for, for cardiac assessments. Now, in radiology itself, it's hard to point to a company that's really got that level of scale. And I think that's the piece that for the AI ecosystem, it's the, it's the, the most valuable piece of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, Blackford's in a great position because we, we really aggregate all of our understanding yeah, selling all sorts of different products to really focus in on how do we understand how to get that business case for adoption going in healthcare. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, that's kind of the secret sauce for Blackwood, right? Um, yeah. And uh, I can't tell you the nuts and bolts. Uh, <laughs> but that, but no, that, I, that, that's really yeah. where we focus our energies. Uh, and, and I guess the, probably the reason why you are in such a sweet spot is because people who are making these, these, these AI companies and AI medical devices, they haven't, most of them haven't done it before. It's been around for five, five years, six years, mainly when we're at a product stage. So, especially in the imaging piece. So I guess that's probably the area in which they need the most help and they need the most support. And the idea that you, you have aggregated and, and focused your efforts on um, becoming as experienced as possible in as many different environments and locations and platforms and, and needs of the customer to enable them to do that. It's absolutely fascinating. And I, I think if, I don't know if there'll be more Blackfords in, in looking at different locations, more, more people like Blackford um, coming along, but it definitely seems like you are there almost as like, the petrol 
or or the electricity almost <laughs> to be more to be more sustainable yeah. so, for the uh, adoption of AI in, in healthcare systems. I mean, there is a there's a plethora of marketplaces and entities that would claim to do this platform piece, and you know some of them do a reasonable job of mm. hooking things up to the packs. Yeah. And, Collating a load of um, different algorithms that you you say right here we are, bam, here's a marketplace and a platform. But I think that the challenge then is okay. Well, what value are you really adding if you can't integrate to a work list, If you can't integrate into reporting? Yeah. Can't if you can't get all of those connections right? It's the extra step that you have. And then on top of that, the commercial piece of yeah. it's great that you have a huge library of all these different applications. But why should I buy any, any of them, right? Yeah, what is yeah. it that makes a difference to me as a hospital or a health system that says, yeah, okay, this actually makes sense. I can see how this fits in there and how this will make me more efficient, how that will effectively make mm. me, right? So mm. everybody in healthcare wants patient outcomes to improve. Yeah. But healthcare margins are very small, right? If you want to be able to deploy a technology that will improve patient outcomes, you have to be able to explain to the, the hospital why they should buy that product and how they will yeah. make it. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's just a sad reality. It, it, yeah, it's yeah. The, the, and this is why I'm so passionate about finding ways to make it more efficient to get products into the market and into use. Mm. Because if we don't find a way to do it, AI in healthcare, AI in medical imaging, <laughs> yeah. is going to wither on the line. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, gosh, just from, from my background in, in, in politics at university, there was that famous quote of um, when America gained independence. I was like, we all, we all hang together, we all, <laughs> all hang separately. <laughs> you know, the founding fathers, that kind of mentality, we all have to be in it together. Um, we all have to work together, which is which is really nice to see, um, because we all have to make this this case. And this is part of, part of the podcast as well, right? Like this is why we do this, um, these things to show off what we do as an industry, how we use AI as an industry, um, not only to knit each other together, but also to, to to show off around the world. Actually, this is the super cool stuff that life sciences are are, are doing with AI. It's how we're utilizing it. These are our challenges, but this is how we're overcoming it. And these are the cool companies that you can be connected with to achieve that. Um, the one thing you, you said five, 10 minutes ago about patterns, and you have to be aware of the patterns um, to enable you to have the 80 20 split with your, your, your features and your platform, right? So, what, what patterns are you seeing that have come in the past year, post COVID potentially? And how do you see them manifesting themselves in the next? 12, 24, 36 months. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a general shift towards telemedicine across right. the world, which is entirely justified by not wanting to be in the same room as the patient if you don't have to be. Mm. Um, and I think that the, the big impact on that has been acceptance through necessity of cloud processing. And I think if you look to the US and you look at um, some massive health systems, I mean, Intermountain, um, MedStar, they're, they're going for a effectively entirely cloud-based X, right? Which is the mm -hmm. viewer and the storage. And that's, I mean, I, I can't imagine that that would have been um, on the horizon two years ago. Yeah. But I think that healthcare in general has been fairly slow in adopting cloud technology yeah for sure but that, that that that's a that's a big fundamental shift and it's pretty exciting because yeah. it it allows the deployment of ai products to be somewhat smoother because you're not trying to spin up you still need something as an edge device within the hospital mm. but you can then look at okay how do we deliver this stuff with exotic GPU requirements or, um, you know, basically you need to be able to spin up something that's 20 cores, but you only need it for 10 minutes and you only need it once a day. I think that that really, it, it opens up all sorts of interesting opportunities for AI, especially in mm. medicine. Mm. Um, 
we're not there yet, right? It's there's still changes that when you look at a site and you see they've gone full cloud, it's pretty exciting, and you go, well, that's interesting. That's a bold move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but honestly, um, I think that that is going to become the way that things happen, right? So yeah. over the next few years, you'll see initially all the PAX vendors moving towards cloud solutions, and mm. you know, I. Blackford, we're already there, right? Our platform can yeah, be deployed yeah. in the cloud, can be deployed on-premise. On but the, the big change that we're seeing is that sites are more open to being cloud first rather than saying, yeah, we'll, we'll think about that in the future. And yeah. I, for me, that's one of the big changes of the pandemic. It, it's just that there's a recognition that there are advantages to not having everything consolidated within a data center within a hospital. Yeah, yeah, I'm right, sure that's the, so do you, do you think, how, 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 how far ahead have we accelerated then? Has, has it been maybe a five-year acceleration, a couple of years acceleration, or can you not really tell at this stage? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess healthcare has caught up with the rest of the world. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a disparaging sense, right? The, the reasons that healthcare was slow to adopt the cloud are entirely reasonable. Yeah, for sure. You've got to have a focus on protecting PHI, of ensuring that patient confidentiality is guaranteed. We, we only need to look at the, you know, the ransomware attacks and the, all that kind of thing. That it, it, it's a massive responsibility that, that yeah. is on the, the IT teams in hospitals. Yeah. But, uh, and and you, you you mix that with the the huge other responsibilities that they have as well, right? <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it takes something as significant as the pandemic to be the trigger that says, okay, we have to drop everything and achieve this. Mm -hmm. But once you've achieved this, you kind of go, oh, well, you know, there's all sorts of other things that we could do, and why would we go back to the old way? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I don't know that we've leapt forward. I think we've caught the rest of the world up. I see. But yeah. getting over that that sense that all the data has to sit within the hospital walls forever. Yeah. I think getting over that perspective, that unlocks a huge amount to just keep up with the world now rather than mm -hmm. kind of falling behind. Yeah, no, I, I don't sure. think, I, I, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm very careful not to disparage the IT teams in hospitals because they have a immense task and an immense mm. responsibility. Um but I think that the the step to being open to cloud has been a very positive one. Yeah, no, for sure. So I think the, the, the conversations that we have and the development of, of products, the, the, the conversation is all about, how, okay, how can we further scale? How can we further democratize? How can we increase access? And it all points to the cloud. Um, so I'm, I, for one, and I'm very excited to see now the impact of widespread adoption of the cloud um and what that means for um ai adoption for what it means for product development and sort of the the the, the increased say, accessibility and scalability and, and usability focus now of, of these ai products um but ben it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you um today uh really fascinating in terms of the the, the platform model uh, and how you guys work at blackford I guess really one thing I'd, I'd love to know from, from people listening is what impact do you guys think um, cloud, uh, the uptake of cloud will have on, on AI medical devices? Um, but from yourself, Ben, I'd love to get you back on in maybe 12, 24 months time um, and, and talk about the, the, the post COVID patterns and see if uh, what actual impacts that there were, um, if, if you'd like to come on later on as well. And, um, but thank you. Thank you for have, uh, coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ben. Okay.